Welcome to my free series of leadership and ritual facilitation videos. You can donate to help me offer more of these classes and write on these topics. There's more information in the video details below. Um, do you keep a ritual journal of what was good, bad, ugly, etc. about how the ritual went down? Do you find trends with certain people in certain places? We actually, I think we've covered some, some of that. Um, as far as the, the trends, but I'll, I'll address it more specifically. As far as a ritual journal, I don't. Uh, I just have a really creepy good memory. And I just, they, these, you know, these rituals are all stuck in my head. Um, and uh, I would say the closest I get to journaling about rituals is if, if I have written down an outline for a ritual, which I don't always do. I don't always write down an outline. Sometimes I just do them. Um, I write down an outline if I'm working with a team and they need the outline to have something concrete on what we're doing. But for my own purposes, I often just do it off the cuff because, um, you know, I'm, I'm used to, to doing these in an extemporaneous way. Um, and because I'm sometimes very much basing the ritual on the group and I can't plan for that until I have experienced the group and their ability to chant and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, the, the closest I get to, to journaling ritual is, is the outlines for rituals that I do or um, when I write articles about rituals uh, or do webinars talking about rituals. Um, so I do, I do try and record the nuggets of the good, the bad, as far as writing things down, but I don't actually keep a, a specific ritual journal. I think I would, it would take so long just to, draft it all out it would it would kind of i would get all obsessive about it and <laughs> um but to your the second part of your question do i find trends with certain people and places absolutely um it's hard to articulate what some of those trends are because it's not necessarily urban versus rural or i don't even know how to put it i mean there's I was talking earlier about how different festivals have different cultures and that is a really strong indicator of how a ritual is going to go. Um, if I'm working with a, a festival culture where they're a lot more, it's a lot more like we all get together to hang out and cook out together and maybe we'll have a few workshops or something, but most of the, most of the people are there to hang out it's actually a lot harder to get people moving and singing in ritual. It's a lot harder to get them emotionally invested in the ritual. I have to work a lot harder at that. Um, public ritual, like pagan pride public. Um, it's just harder. It's, it's just harder to get people, you know, to, to do things because it's, It's, you know, you're standing out there in a public park, there's other sounds and things going on, you might be having people just stand around and watch. So it's, it's kind of a fishbowl kind of a sensation. So it's really hard to get into a deep cathartic headspace in a, in a, in a place like that. Um, there's exceptions. There's exceptions to that. But in, in general, a big, you know, when it's that public, it's really, it's really hard to get people into that deeper um, kind of cathartic headspace. I'm trying to think of other trends. What are some of the things that you had in mind when you were thinking about like about specific trends? Well, like if you know, like if you are always doing, let's say St. Louis Pagan Pride Day at this time, if you know, you already know that since you've done it before, the weather may be dicey, some people are gonna be grumpy, mm -hmm. you know, make sure you tell people beforehand you may want to get a coffee or a drink or something, wear nice clothes, have some cough drops handy you know, things like that, because mm -hmm. I, I tend to keep a ritual journal of rituals that I've written, and then my own personal feedback afterwards of what went well, what I think went well, mm -hmm. and what I should never, ever try again. You know, small things, really. Right. Well, and then there's, and there's things that you should never, ever try again with that particular kind of group, but that totally work in a, in a different group. Yeah, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm, I realize I'm having a, a hard time putting into words the energetic sense that I get from people, but I can, I call it my satellite dish of like, 
there's, there are certain group energetic profiles that I just kind of hear almost that it, I'm really clear that it's, it's going to be hard to get this group of people moving energetically. Um, I don't want to say it's harder to raise energy with a rural group because that, that's, that's a bigger axiom than I want to, I want to say, but what I, I guess, I guess what I mean by that is like the smaller festivals that are more focused on community tend to be more rural. They tend to be, it's not always the case, but they, they tend to be. And those tend to be harder to get people to participate. Like even in workshops, like when I ask, when I start out a workshop and I, I usually start out with a check-in where I say, okay, so we're going to talk about pagan leadership. You know, what are some issues that you've had come up for you? What are some things you'd like to learn? And, and in rural areas or at the festivals where it's more about social interaction, I have a harder time getting people to even speak up at those festivals and, and be willing to, to speak about like what, what brought you here? You know, why are you interested in this workshop? They'll, they'll sometimes they'll just look away and I'm just, I'm just, I'm just here. So, you know, when I've got a lot of folks that are not willing to even check in in a workshop, it's going to be really difficult to get them moving in ritual. It's going to be hard to get them singing. Um, smoking. Smoking is an indicator. The more smokers, the harder it is to get people moving and singing. I could not tell you why, uh, but that is absolutely what I have noticed, is that the more smokers there are in the group, the harder it is. To, now, with singing, it's, you know, that's a little obvious, is that they have less lung capacity for singing, and, uh, and singing will often give them coughing fits. I've, had, I've experienced that with uh, a lot of really heavy smokers. But yeah, the, the more smoking culture and the more the more people smoke I, again I, I could not tell you why it is but that is something that i have experienced the more smokers there are that it seems like um, the harder it is to get people moving in ritual and uh or check in for workshops i'd love to sick a team of anthropologists on you know on the pagan community to answer questions like this i'm trying to think of some other dynamics that i've that i've observed Gosh, I'm just having a hard time thinking of uh, of things beyond that. Trends with certain people and places. Well, I, you know, I and if if people are used to ecstatic rituals, they are far more willing to jump in and, and get in there. And if they're used to what I would refer to as arms at your sides rituals, where they're just watching people, that's what they've been trained to do. And that's what the, the participants are used to. Um, so it's, it's, it takes more to break them out of that and to get them to actually participate. It takes longer. Um, but I would say that's, you know, there, there really aren't many folks doing ecstatic ritual in the Midwest. And those are, that's mostly where I'm running into folks. So, you know, it depends. It depends. Um, I'm going to have to think about that. I'm going to have to think about that because I think there probably are more patterns that I've noticed, but I, you know, I would have to, I would have to think about that. Um, but it's, it's just like, it's a, it's an energetic sense of the, of the group and their, you know, there's, there's a certain energetic profile when there's a lot of shy people. I can just feel that when there's a lot of shy people and I'm going to have to work a heck of a lot harder as a ritualist if there's a lot of shy people to make space for them. So does that, does that help any? Is, does it just get the wheels turning for more? <laughs> well, it's got you thinking for more answers. So, but, uh, but like I said, I, I tend to keep track of where I am, what I'm doing, what worked, what didn't. And sometimes it's just as simple as, just don't forget that in September, the weather's dicey. Mm -hmm. So check the weather. You know, I have two rituals ready. <laughs> check the weather beforehand. And if it looks like it's going to rain, switch to plan B. 
or plan C or plan whatever it is, just to be sure. I think it's fantastic that you keep a ritual journal with all that information. I, I think that's awesome. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad that you do that because I think that's just, it's a fantastic tool. And it hadn't occurred to me to, to suggest that to people to do, but um, I absolutely suggest that, that people do that. Like if you've got a, if you've got a really creepy memory and you remember lots of stuff, you know, go ahead and rely on your memory. That's, that's cool. But um, you know, writing it down is, is really, is really useful because there's a lot of stuff that, that can, you know, that can slip your mind like that. Um, so yeah, that's really, and the, and the, yeah, the, never do this ever again. <laughs> always, I have quite a few of those. Always test out your cauldron. What if you have any questions about ritual facilitation or leadership for pagan groups, please feel free to contact me. I love questions and I love writing articles or recording videos for actual issues that people are facing in the community. If this webinar is useful for you, please consider donating. It is my goal to make this education available for all, but to do that I have to pay the bills. I also have several books available and there are links below under show more or you can contact me via my website or social media.